awesome we are live now hello and welcome everyone to another session by the product folks i'm aditya and i have abhay with me to host the event tonight thanks for joining in on a sunday night this is our first product conversation session after a long time because india was battling with covid and our community was trying to help with all those initiatives super happy to see everyone back and we have an amazing session lined up for all of you today but before we kick start the session and introduce our speaker for today just a quick introduction about tpf for those who are attending our events for the first time uh, the product folks is a volunteer driven community for product managers marketers designers and everyone interested in product apart from conducting these uh, sessions and events we also have a bunch of other initiatives if you are into product we recently revamped, revamped our entire brand and the website so do go there if you have any feedback dm us and check out the initiatives especially if you are looking to break into product management you will find tons of interesting resources there we also have an initiative called insurgo which is an apm program and we are going to launch the v2 for it so do keep an eye out for uh, that on our social handles i'll add the links in the chat uh, in a bit and with that i'm handing it over to abhay to talk about the session and our speaker for today thanks uh, thanks aditya uh, and uh, happy to have teresa today uh, thanks everyone for joining uh, we have a q and a tab where you can post uh, your questions throughout the session and uh, we will be picking up all the questions at the end of the session but you can put your questions uh, in between of the sessions as well uh, so quickly introducing about teresa and teresa is an internationally acclaimed author speaker and coach she teaches a structured and sustainable approach to continuous discovery that helps product teams infuse their daily product decisions with customer inputs she has coached hundreds of teams and thousands of people uh, at companies of all sizes from early stage startups to global enterprises in variety of industries as well she is the author of the book continuous discovery habits and the blog producttalk.org uh, we'll put the links in the chat soon for uh, In this session Teresa will be speaking on continuous discovery and how product teams can implement their tools and techniques to continue to discover new avenues for growth new products and methods to improve your product. I am super excited about this session today and I hope you enjoy it too. Keep sharing your questions throughout the session and in case you are putting any thread on Twitter then do tag the product folks and Teresa as well. Uh or if you want to share your notes you can uh, always uh, DM us on Twitter as well. over to you then all right thank you all right so welcome everybody to the what and why of continuous discovery um as mentioned in the intro i'm teresa torres i've worked as a product discovery coach um and i've been really fortunate in that i've gotten to work with teams all over the world um part of the reason why, why i like to share this at the start of the talk is to let you know that um the framework and the tools that we're going to talk through have been used in a lot of different contexts and what's great about that is that um oftentimes when i hear people talking about uh, uh when they hear a talk it's easy to think oh that works for the facebooks and the amazons of the world but it would never work at my company so what i want to share is that these methods have worked in a lot of different types of organizations of all sizes different industries around the world Um so I want to encourage you to think about how might you bring some of this to your own organization. Okay, so we're going to dive right in. Um I'm going to start by distinguishing um product discovery from product delivery. So what do we mean by by discovery? We often talk about this in contrast to to delivery. So delivery is all of the work that we're doing to build, ship and maintain a production quality product. Discovery on the other hand are all the decisions that we're making about what to build. And the reason why this distinction has become so important over the last 10 plus years is that we're seeing a lot of companies put a ton of emphasis on delivery and maybe forget to put an equal emphasis on discovery. And discovery is really what's going to help to ensure that the things that we're building have an impact. Now a lot of us discovery has become really popular in the last 5 to 10 years if you've been to any conferences or read books or read the leading blogs um odds are you've heard this term before. Most of us are learning about discovery from a project mindset. Right? So we're still overall as an industry moving away from waterfall towards agile and a lot of our research methods have been influenced by um this sort of project mindset. What do I mean by that? So when we kick off a new project, we interview a bunch of customers, we create a shiny research report, 
as we're making decisions about what to build, we refer to that research report. And then maybe when we're done with all the design, we validate it with our customers and then we hand it off to engineers. There's nothing wrong with project-based research. Um, in fact, it's definitely better than no discovery. But what we're seeing is that the best teams are starting to shift towards a continuous discovery mindset. And what's driving that is that teams are adopting a continuous delivery cadence, and we're seeing our discovery methods evolve to match that cadence. So I want to start with just a very clear definition of what is it, what is it that I mean by continuous discovery. So I define continuous discovery as at a minimum weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they're conducting small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now, I know there's a lot to this definition. We're actually going to spend the bulk of the talk just breaking it down and working to understand what does this mean. So let's start with this first line, which is just weekly touch points with customers. So as product people, and it, by that I mean product managers, designers, software engineers, anybody who's working on a digital product, we're making product decisions every day. Some of them are big strategic decisions like what do we, um, which customers should we serve? What opportunities should we go after? What goes on our roadmap? Others are smaller or medium-sized decisions like what do we label this button? How do we expose this feature in the interface? How should the workflow work? Or what does the underlying data model look like? Most of us are learning that we need to infuse those big strategic decisions with some pro project-based research, but we forget that those small to medium-sized decisions could also benefit from continuous feedback from our customers. Here's why. Product people, those of us who are working on our products all day, every day, suffer from a bias called the curse of knowledge. So we have developed expertise about how our product works, what functionality is available, where everything is in the interface. And the curse of knowledge is a bias that says it's hard for us to remember what it's like to not have that knowledge. So as we're making all these daily decisions, we're making them from our own perspectives, and we forget that our customers don't have the same depth of knowledge. So one of our goals to overcome this curse of knowledge is just to engage with our customers every week. If we increase the frequency at which we engage with customers, we have more chances to close the gap between how we think about the product and how our customers think about the product. So we wanna make sure that all those small daily decisions are being made from our customer's perspective and not from our perspective. So if we only talk to customers once a month, it means we're making a month worth of decisions without any customer input. Now I know for a lot of teams, this cadence of engaging with customers every week seems really hard. So if you've never talked to a customer, I want you to just focus on how can you find your first customer to talk to. And if you talk to customers every month, then I want you to think about how can I talk to customers every other week? Or how can I talk to, how can I eventually get to weekly? So take a continuous improvement mindset to this. You don't have to suddenly tomorrow start talking to a customer every week, but you wanna try to increase the frequency at which you're talking to customers. Now what this does is it starts, um, it starts to help us shift away from this project-based research and this validation mindset, where we're only engaging with customers at the very end and instead, it helps us adopt a co-creation mindset. This is where we're going to get feedback from customers much earlier in the process. We're going to share with them our half-baked ideas. Um, we're going to share pencil drawings with them. When we get feedback earlier in the process, it's a lot easier to integrate their feedback. We're able to act on their suggested changes. Now, I want to be clear here. Whenever I talk about co-creating with customers, somebody brings up either the Steve Jobs quote where he said, customers don't know what they want until we show it to them, or the Henry Ford quote where he said, if I had asked you, if I had asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So when I talk about co-creating with customers, I'm not talking about asking our customers for what they want. I'm talking about engaging with customers to understand who they are, what their world is like, what context they operate in, and we're combining that knowledge with our knowledge about technology and that's what's leading to better products. So we're not gonna go to our customers and say, hey, what should we build? That's not gonna lead to good solutions. Instead, we're gonna go to our customers and say, um, tell me about your life, tell me a story. We'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so we've covered this first line, weekly touch points with customers. I wanna get into the second point, which is by the team building the product. So this starts with this idea of a product trio. 
Some people will call this a triad, a three-legged stool of three amigos. The idea is it's a product manager, a designer, and a software engineer collaboratively making joint decisions about what to build. So this is the team that's leading discovery. Now, I want to be really clear here. I don't want to see you have a discovery team and a delivery team. Our goal is to avoid handoffs. So the team that is building the product, these three roles on that team are leading discovery, right? So they're leading the decision making about what to build. Now, most of us have other people on our team. Um, you probably have more than one engineer on your team. Depending on your DevOps strategy, you, probably have, you may still have a QA person on your team. Depending on how you interface with the rest of the business, you might have data analysts or data scientists or product marketing managers or user researchers or customer success folks or any other number of roles on your team. So where did, what role do they play in discovery? I can't emphasize this enough. Everybody should be involved in discovery. The key idea with the trio is that we're looking for a small cross-functional team that can quickly make decisions. So they're still engaging everybody else on the team. They're still communicating what's happening and what they're learning week over week. They're still inviting people to participate in the other in your discovery activities. But this small trio is driving the discovery process. And what this allows is that if we have a small team that's responsible for decision making and they're continuously engaging with customers, we can make sure that we're continuously closing that gap between how the product team thinks about the product and how the customer thinks about the product. OK, so we've covered weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product. Let's get into the last two lines of the definition. This is where we're going to get into the meat of the talk. So the goal, we've got a trio. They're engaging with customers every week. Their goal is to conduct small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. And these two lines go really well together. So if we can't take our project-based research and try to do it every week, right? It's just not sustainable. So we first have to adjust our research activities to be small enough that we can do them week over week. And then we need to remember the goal of our research is to drive an outcome. So let's get into what this looks like. So I want to introduce my opportunity solution tree. This is a really simple visual that I designed to help a product trio chart the best path to their desired outcome. So let's talk a little bit about outcomes and why they matter. So traditionally in a waterfall model, um, a product team would be working against a roadmap, a fixed set of features that they were working to deliver against a schedule. What's wrong with that? What we see is teams are trying to predict the future. They're trying to say in January, this is what we'll be building in November. And the problem with that is that the world is always changing. We got a pretty big dose of this in the last 18 months, right? Where the world changed radically around us. Now, hopefully we're not always gonna be living through a global pandemic, but we do see change all the time. We see um, new competitors enter our market. We see technology disrupt our market. We see every time we ship something to our customers, we see their needs, pain points, and desires evolve. So when we talk about outputs and delivering fixed outputs, we're talking about a world where we believe that things are mostly stable and we can predict the future. When we shift to outcomes, what we're saying is we're not sure what outputs we're going to build next month or three months or six months from now, but we know we need to create business value, and this is how we're going to measure that business value. So we're looking for a metric that's measuring, are we creating value for the business? And so what this might look like is imagine that you, um, I believe Netflix is available in India. Um, so I'm going to use Netflix as my example. Uh, imagine that the business leaders at Netflix said, um, we need to increase subscriber retention. That's the business value that the leader is saying we need this product team to focus on. The product team now needs to translate that business outcome to a product outcome. And a product outcome is typically a behavior you can measure in the product. It's something your customer is doing. So in this case, the Netflix product team might say, OK, the best way we think we can increase subscriber retention is to increase the average viewing minutes per week. right? So we're going to try to get people to watch Netflix more. That's their product outcome. So again, they're not saying we're going to build feature A, B, and C. We're saying we're going to move this number, and we believe that if we move this number, it will create business value. Now, our jobs is not just to create business value. We also want to create customer value. So that's where the second part of this tree comes in. 
We need to work to discover the opportunities that would drive that outcome. So opportunities are where we're capturing customer value because they represent needs, pain points, and desires. So what do our customers need from us? What are their pain points? What are their desires? That if we addressed them would help drive our outcome. So if we think about this Netflix example, if we want to increase viewer minutes, we might hear opportunities like, I can't find anything to watch. I don't know if the show is good or not. I don't like watching the intro over and over again, right? So we're starting to hear what are the needs, pain points, and desires that if we address them could increase um, our outcome. And then finally, we need to discover the solutions that would address those opportunities. So broadly, when we're talking about small research activities in pursuit of a desired outcome, those small research activities are gonna be about interviewing to discover opportunities. We'll talk about that in a minute and then assumption testing to evaluate our solutions. So we're gonna get into both of those activities here. So it starts with we have to set our outcome. And remember I talked about outcomes, we're trying to balance, we're trying to identify business value. So we wanna see our product leader, so a chief product officer, a VP of product. If you work at a really large company, it might be the GM, the general manager of your business unit. It's the across, it's the leader who has the across the business view of what business value your team can create. So at Netflix, your leader is saying, um, uh, we need you to increase subscriber retention and the product trio is translating that to a product outcome. Once that's in place, we can now adopt our continuous cadence of weekly touch points. And our first small research activity that we're gonna do is we're interviewing to discover opportunities. So a lot of people think about, I'm gonna interview to explore my solutions. I'm gonna ask people what they think. I want you to think about interviewing as a way to discover the opportunity space. So we're listening for needs, pain points, and desires. Now the reason why most teams struggle to adopt a continuous cadence where they're engaging with customers every week is because recruiting is a real challenge. It's hard to find a customer every week. So I'm gonna talk about the way to overcome this challenge is to automate your recruiting process. Now, what, what I mean by this is I want you to show up to work on Monday, look at your calendar, and see that you already have an interview on your calendar that week without you having to do anything to get it there. It's like magic. I'm gonna give you the three primary methods for how to do this. The first is you can recruit people while they're using your product or service. So this is a really simple idea. You show it to a percentage of your traffic, you ask for a small amount of time, you offer them an incentive or a reward, you give them a link where they can schedule their interview right then and there. This works in the vast majority of B2C contexts and B2B SaaS products where your end users are working out of your product day to day. If you're in a B2B context and your end users or your buyers are not in your product, this is where you wanna work with your customer facing teams to help you recruit. So what do I mean by that? Your sales teams, your account management teams, your support, um, customer support teams, what you can do is you can define weekly triggers. So you can say, hey, customer facing teams, if you talk to a customer who expresses this need, ask them if they're willing to spend 20 minutes with the product team. So it's the same idea, small ask, offer a reward, but instead of um, presenting the ask through your website or service, you're doing it through your customer facing teams. Now there are some markets that are teeny tiny. Maybe you have 12 customers in your total addressable market, or your customers are their time is very valuable. So we see this with like Fortune 500 CEOs. We see this with um, respiratory ICU doctors and nurses during COVID, where if your customers are people that have very limited time and you're not likely to be able to schedule an interview with them ad hoc, what you can do is you can invite them to participate in a customer advisory board where you invite say a dozen customers and you set up a long-term ongoing relationship with them. What this allows you to do is it allows you to understand their schedule. It allows you to find gaps where you can say, okay, we're gonna schedule a once a month, 20 minute interview on Sunday afternoon, because that's what's easiest for you. This is a great way for those really hard to reach markets to just get to know your customers on an ongoing basis. The risk with this model is if your, if your market is large and you're only talking to a handful of customers, you're gonna run the risk of designing a product that doesn't work for the market. So you only wanna use this strategy if you have a teeny tiny total addressable market, or you wanna mix and match it with the other methods. 
where you set, you work with a few customers through your advisory board, and you also use one of the other methods to recruit for variation. Okay, I'm gonna cover a lot of ground in this talk. At the very end, I'm gonna give you resources for where you can dig in and learn more. So if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, just relax, enjoy the talk, and we'll give you um, a really simple way to capture an overview. Okay, so once we have a customer in the room, our goal now is how do we ask the right questions? The key here is we wanna avoid speculative questions. So speculative questions are when we ask our customers direct questions like who, what, why, how, when questions. Um, a lot of this is because humans are not very good at understanding what we do, why we do it, how we do it. We rarely take the time to reflect on our own behavior. So if you've read anything online about interviewing, you might've heard advice like don't ask a leading question, um, ask open-ended questions. That is good advice, but it's not good enough. Because if I stick with my Netflix example, I might wanna know what you like to watch, how you decide what to watch, where you watch, what device you watch on. And I can ask you those questions, but if I do so, your answers aren't very reliable. Cognitive biases are gonna interfere. Now I could ask you a non-leading open-ended question, like tell me about your experience on Netflix, but that's still a speculative question because you don't really take the time to reflect on your experience. Your brain just gives you a fast answer. The problem is that answer does not necessarily reflect reality. So in interviewing, our goal is to collect specific stories about the past. So I don't wanna say, tell me about your experience on Netflix. I wanna say, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, or tell me about the last time you had to choose a new show on Netflix. This is what's gonna allow me to keep the interview grounded in a specific instance. So instead of you having to think about how do I summarize my behavior, you're just telling me a story about how you actually did something. Now, the beauty of collecting specific stories is that customer needs, pain points, and desires, what we've been calling opportunities, will start to emerge from those stories. So you'll naturally start to hear needs, pain points, and de desires that you can start to address. Okay, once we have a handle on the opportunity space and we're starting to get a sense for if we address these needs, we could drive this, this outcome, I want you to choose a single target opportunity to work with and to generate multiple solutions for that target opportunity. This is very different from what most teams do. Most teams hear a customer problem and they jump to the first solution. What's wrong with this? When we work with one solution at a time, we're asking what decision-making researchers call a whether or not decision. Is this idea good or not? Should we build this or not? The problem with whether or not decisions is they set us up to fall prey to two different cognitive biases. The first is called the escalation of commitment. This is a bias that says the more that we invest in an idea, the more we identify with it, and in the product world, the more we're gonna fall in love with our idea, which is gonna exacerbate the second bias, which is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias says, we're likely to see the evidence that supports our idea and miss all the evidence that suggests our idea is flawed. So what this means is that even if you're doing all the right discovery activities, you're prototyping, you're getting qualitative feedback, you're running quantitative experiments, you're still likely to miss the evidence that suggests your idea is flawed. So if you want to experiment well and to truly evaluate your ideas, we need to change the question. We need to set up a compare and contrast decision. And instead of saying, is this idea good or not? We need to work with sets of ideas and say which of these ideas looks most promising. I wanna give you an analogy for this. I want you to imagine that you were in a stadium full of people back when we could do that, and you were watching Usain Bolt running around a track by himself. Usain Bolt was at one point the world's fastest 100 meter runner. If I asked you, is Usain Bolt fast? That's a whether or not question. Is he fast or not? That's hard to answer. Is he fast relative to a cheetah? Probably not. Is he fast relative to a Tesla in the first 100 meters? I don't know, I'd love to see that race. Is he fast relative to other humans? Absolutely. So what we're seeing here in this picture on the right is a clear compare and contrast decision. We can look at the data and say we have a winner. That's what we're looking for when we're experimenting. We wanna take our three solutions, compare and contrast them against each other and look for a clear winner. Now the reason why we don't do this very often is because our project-based research won't work for three ideas. We don't have time to build all three ideas and A-B test them. 
We don't have time to prototype end to end all three ideas, schedule a bunch of interviews and get qualitative feedback on all of them. So the key to setting up good compare and contrast decisions and being able to quickly collect feedback is to break your ideas down into their underlying assumptions. Now this is not a new idea. Eric Reese introduced it back in 2011 in the Lean Startup. The reason why most of us don't do this is it's really hard to see our own assumptions. So I'm gonna walk you through an example of how this works. So we're gonna stick with our Netflix example. I want you to imagine that we interviewed a bunch of Netflix users and here in the US, Netflix is really good at TV shows and movies, but we don't have any sports on Netflix. So let's imagine you, you interview a bunch of Netflix users and you keep hearing this opportunity, I wanna watch sports over and over again. So, okay, we gotta solve this desire, I wanna watch sports. So you know you need to set up a good compare and contrast decision. We generate three strong ideas. The first is we're gonna partner with the local networks that show sports. So here in the US, we have three local networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. I'm sure you have the equivalent. These are our public networks that a lot of our local sports get shown on. So Netflix could say, let's just partner with those TV channels and integrate their content into Netflix. Second idea could be, let's actually go straight to the sports league. So again, here in the US, that's Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA. In um, India, that might be your cricket leagues or your soccer leagues, right? Where we're gonna go directly to those leagues and say, can we license your games and include them in Netflix. The third idea could be, Netflix could say, look, we're not very good at sports. We don't wanna get into the sports business. Let's just partner with somebody who is good at sports. So Fubo TV is a streaming service that's already good at sports. Maybe Netflix partners with them and says, look, when somebody buys a Netflix subscription, let's give them a Fubo TV subscription for free and vice versa. So what do we have here? We have three different solutions that all address the same target opportunity. We wanna compare and contrast them against each other. Our project-based research is not gonna work. We can't build all three and A-B test them. That would take months, right? Even prototyping all three and getting qualitative feedback would take too long. We don't have time to do all of the design work before we learn which solution is gonna work. Plus, each of these ideas carries other risk that you wouldn't be able to test with prototypes. Right, there's business development risks. Can we partner with these leagues? Can we partner with these channels? Can we partner with Fubo TV? So we need a better way to quickly test these ideas. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each of our ideas and break them down into their underlying assumptions. And then we're gonna test those assumptions quickly. So many of you have probably seen this Venn diagram. It's becoming really common. We talk about our job as product teams is to release desirable, viable, and feasible products. I'm gonna add two more categories, but first let's walk through what these categories mean. Desirability is, the, is customer value. Do customers want this? But it also captures, are they willing to do what we need them to do to get value out of the idea, right? So we often need customers to behave in a certain way in order to get value out of our solutions. Are they willing to do that? Viability assumptions are things like, um, is it good for the business? If you're an outcome focused team, it's will it drive your outcome? Feasibility assumptions are, is it technically possible? Can we build it? Usability assumptions are, um, can our customers find it? Do they understand it? Are they able to do what we need them to do? Oh, I forgot to, okay. And then ethical assumptions are, um, you know, is there any potential harm to building this idea? What data are we collecting? How are we storing it? Is it safe? Are we using it ethically? Do our customers understand that? Who are we serving? Who are we leaving out based on those decisions of who we're serving? So this ethical assumptions category is a big one um, that we often forget to examine. So these categories can help you generate assumptions, but even so it can be hard to see our own assumptions. So one of the best ways to surface assumptions is to story map your ideas. So the yellow part of this, sli this so slide is our story map. I'll walk through it in a minute. The way that you story map an idea is I want you to imagine the idea already exists. So you're not story mapping what it would take to build it. Instead, you're projecting in the future. You're saying we already built it, it already exists. What does our customer have to do to get value from the idea? So in this Netflix example with integrating local channels, first our customer would have to decide to watch the game. Then they would have to choose a streaming service. We would hope it's Netflix. 
then they would have to open that service, then they would have to choose the local channel, and then they would have to watch the game. Now, what's nice about story mapping is that we can now go step by step and say, what assumptions are we making? What needs to be true in order for our customer to be able to do this step? So in this very first step, they have to decide to watch the game. What needs to be true? Our subscribers have to want to watch sports. And we're going to see this assumption is shared across all three of our ideas, which is one of the reasons why assumption testing is faster, is we can test an assumption that either supports a set of ideas or throws out the set of ideas. Now, as we move over to this find a local channel step, we're going to see assumptions that differentiate this idea from our other ideas. So in this case, Integrating local channels only addresses the target opportunity, I want to watch sports, if your subscribers know what channel the game is on. If they don't know what channel the game is on, this solution is not going to work for them. right? So I can go step by step and enumerate my assumptions. Now, some assumptions will be shared across all three of your ideas. If you're unsure about the opportunity, you're going to start with those assumptions. Some assumptions are going to differentiate your ideas. And when you're comparing and contrasting, those are the assumptions you're going to test. So I'm going to walk through four ways you can quickly test assumptions. And I want you to think about assumption tests as something you can do in a couple hours to a day or two. When we assumption test in a day or two, it means we can start our week on Monday with a set of solutions and by Friday have good compare and contrast data. So we're going to play with this assumption, subscribers want to watch sports. And I'm going to give you three easy ways to test this assumption. And then I'm going to give you a fourth way to test another category of assumptions. So first, we can prototype to test this assumption. Now, I want to be really clear. We're not prototyping the whole idea. We don't have to do pixel perfect design because we're not testing the whole idea. We only have to prototype the step in which the customer is in which in the story map in which the assumption occurs. So we need a prototype that simulates the moment of deciding to watch the game. So I could create a one screen prototype of, hey, here's some things to watch. What would you like to watch? And that prototype could include TV shows, movies, and sporting events. And if some of my customers are sports fans, I would expect some of them to choose a sporting event. I can create that mock-up in an hour or two. And if I have access to an unmoderated testing tool, I can get feedback in a day. I can rapidly test this assumption. Second way I could test this assumption, I can launch a one question survey. So one question surveys are usually launched within the product. So it's just like recruiting from within the product. We're trying to capture our customer's attention while they're using our product or service. So a lot of web-based and mobile-based products are doing this directly in the product. Netflix would have to do this on the home screen, probably would make it easy for you to respond with a remote control. Now, here's the thing. Surveys get a bad rap because asking a reliable survey question is hard. Um, we're going to remember the tips I gave you on interviewing. You don't want to ask speculative questions. So I don't want to say, do you watch sports? Because if you've ever watched a sporting event in your entire life, you can answer yes to that question. But that's not giving me reliable feedback. I want to ask about specific instances in the past so in this case, I might say, have you watched a sporting event in the last week? I could get more specific. I could say, have you watched a cricket match in the last week? Um, depends on what I'm trying to learn. Most of us can collect one question survey results in a few hours or a day at most because we're capturing people's attention directly in our product. The third way we could test this assumption is we could ask, are our customers already exhibiting the behavior we expect them to see? So if they're sports fans, what might they already be doing inside Netflix? So maybe they don't know that Netflix doesn't have sports. And we could go see if our customers are already searching for sports. So we're going to go search our search queries and see if any of them are related to sports. This is something we can do in an hour. We can evaluate the last thousand search queries and look for queries related to sports. So in a very short period of time, I just gave you three ways you could test our subscribers want to watch sports. You could prototype a single screen and use unmoderated testing tools to rapidly get feedback. You could launch a one question survey and get feedback in a couple hours or a day. Or you could mine your existing user behavior data and get feedback in an hour or two. For the vast majority of your assumptions, one of these three methods is going to be very effective at helping you collect, compare, and contrast data. Now, there is 
one category of assumptions where these are not your best methods. And that's feasibility assumptions. So is it possible? Can we do this? Feasibility assumptions, the best activity usually is to set a research spike. But you're not telling your engineers, a research spike is just a time box period of time where you tell your engineers to go investigate the feasibility. What you're not doing is telling them to go build the solution. So let me give an example from our Netflix example. What we're doing is maybe, maybe we have a concern that our local channel can't give us a feed that has all the data we need. So we tell our engineers, go try to process the feed, look at the last 100 events, what percentage of the events have an appropriate title, an appropriate description, an appropriate image, can we accurately display the events in our interface? And what we're looking for is, do we have a high enough success rate? So we're giving our engineers a very specific assumption to test. We're time boxing it. We're allowing them to go collect data. OK, so what we did here was we just took our solutions. We broke them down into their underlying assumptions. We're collecting compare and contrast data. We're able to quickly make decisions about will our solution address our opportunity in a way that drives our outcome. When it addresses the opportunity, we're creating customer value. When it drives the outcome, we're creating business value. So we just covered a lot of ground. We started with setting outcomes. We talked about interviewing to discover opportunities. We talked about assumption testing to explore solutions. If you want to learn more about any of these methods, I go into a very, very hands-on detail in my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. This is available at on Amazon in India in both paperback and Kindle. It's also available at other retailers. Should be fairly easy to find. This was meant to be a hands-on guide to help you put this into practice right away. So I recommend checking it out. All right, I think we're ready for questions. Awesome, awesome. That was an amazing session, Teresa. Personally learned a lot from it and loved how you took Netflix as an analogy and explained a bunch of concept, concepts. I'm sure it was super helpful for everyone else to understand as well. And if that's and if it's okay, we'll also share the back with everyone post the session so that they can refer back and they'll be able to see all the informational charts and everything else included uh, in the deck. So we'll jump right into the question so we can make most of Teresa's time. Uh, the first question that we have is, uh, is continuous dis uh, delivery similar to product-led growth or how is it different? Are both of them similar? Can they be replaced in some orgs or how do they differ? Yeah, let me make sure I understood. Are you asking is continuous discovery similar to product-led growth? Uh, continuous delivery, one of the concepts that you talked about. With ah, the OK. So the idea of product-led growth is this simple. It's, it's we want to create a good product that will inspire word of mouth. The product itself will. I'm getting some echo. Are there people hearing that? Yeah, I just uh, muted. I think it was from his sent. But okay. Uh... Okay. Yeah. So the idea of product-led growth, right, is that we're gonna let we're gonna use our product to drive our growth. So it could be a few things. It's that our customers love the product, so they get word of mouth. It could be that we're building um, viral uh, loops directly into the product, where the more you invite other people to use the product, you get more value out of it. There's lots of ways to think about product-led growth. But the key to unlocking product-led growth is you need to understand customer value because all product-led growth is driven by creating customer value because your customer is who's driving that product-led growth. So I would say that continuous discovery and continuous delivery both are great mechanisms for how to unlock product-led growth. Got it. And especially in early stages, uh when there are limited resources and only limited people who can work on each problem, uh, how would you suggest them to go about it? Yeah, so this is where we didn't get to cover this in very much detail in the talk, but I cover it um, in depth in the book, which is as you're interviewing to discover opportunities, there's a key activity you're going to have to do, which is opportunity mapping. So really using that tree structure to map out the opportunity space. That's going to help you with prioritization. You can't address every opportunity that you hear from your customer. You're going to have to do the work to understand the impact of different opportunities. And so there's this exercise you'll go through of assessing and prioritizing the opportunity space. 
and doing it in a way to make sure that you're always working on the highest impact opportunities. And this is really critical in almost every organization. We're going to uncover more opportunities than we can possibly deliver against. So we need to do the work to understand where can we have the most impact. And these are some of the most strategic decisions we make as product teams is which opportunity should we go after. And then the second piece of that is we want to look for the smallest solutions that will address those opportunities. And that's where assumption testing can really have a big impact. We often overbuild because we assume customers need all these features, whereas really they just want their opportunity to be addressed. And so assumption testing will help you identify what's the smallest solution that will address this opportunity so you can move on to the next one. Awesome, awesome. Abhay, do you want to pick the next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you've moved to uh, consulting and coaching from the product role. So over the last few years, what are the common mistakes that you've seen clients making, specifically in the discovery side of things or uh, product in general that you have observed common mistakes? Yeah, so the first one is that, um, you know, a lot, of a lot of teams feel like I have no problem recruiting customers. I'm just going to do it the way that I always have. And they don't take the time to automate the recruiting process. And here's what happens. If it's pretty easy to get a customer in the room, you might think, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. But then you're going to have a week, and these happen way more often than we think, where your delivery, your release went astray. you got to scramble all hands on deck. Or you have a customer who's upset and you have to scramble and respond to that customer. And what happens during those weeks? We stop doing our continuous discovery process because we haven't automated the recruiting process. So even if recruiting is fairly easy for you, I would still recommend automating the recruiting process so that when your design, if your designer normally does the recruiting and they're on vacation, you're going to stop interviewing, right? So the key is everybody needs to know how to interview. Your recruiting process needs to be automated so that you have a really robust habit of interviewing every week. The second thing that I see teams do is they skip over this opportunity mapping step. They just hear a customer problem and they want to jump straight to a solution. And usually that's because we're really empathetic and we want to serve our customers. The problem with it is not all opportunities are equally valuable. Some needs are not that important to our customers. They may gripe about them, but they're not that important to them. So we need to take the time to make sure that we're solving the right problems. Got it, got it, thanks. And uh, one more question is, uh, you have written the book on product management, which is a, a very niche area, and you have also been writing on product.org. So do you recommend writing in general for people who wants to become uh, better at you know, decisions making in product management? Yeah, this is a really good question. I actually think, so I personally really like to write, which is why I chose to blog. I know that not everybody expresses themselves best in writing. If you do, I think writing is a great way to help you see your own thinking. But I think you can do it in other ways too, right? Some people have podcasts and they interview people and they explore ideas with other people. Some people create videos because they like to talk through their ideas. I think the key is to find the medium that allows you to really hone your thoughts, to think through your ideas, and to sharpen your thinking. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think the key is to find the way that best matches how you like to work. Awesome. So uh, another question that uh, we had was, you spoke about co-creating with customers. And I think that's super important, uh, irrespective of the stage of the company. But for people who are just getting started, either budding product managers or people who have just kickstarted their product career, what would you suggest them to do for their first user research study or the interview, right? What are some common mistakes they can avoid and how can they be better at it? I know you talked about it uh, in the deck and your book also must have a lot of practical tips. But if you had to highlight, say, top two or three things that folks could do to get better at user research, what would that be? Yeah, so on the interviewing side, I would we touched on it a little bit in the talk. It's really making sure most of the interview is grounded in specific instances. So again, that's that. Instead of saying, tell me about your experience on Netflix, it's tell me about the last time you watched Netflix. And the challenge with that is if I ask you, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, you're going to say, oh, I watched a movie yesterday. It's not a very good story, right? So the interviewer has to do the work to pull out the story. To, to pull out the narrative of the story. And it's going to take some practice. 
I do give really hands-on tips in the book. We also have uh, a, a course on interviewing that gives you space to practice. Um, so that's an option. I will also share with the audience that we do through the Product Talk Academy at learn.producttalk.org. We do have skill-based courses on this. I know that the price point doesn't always work for people in India. We offer scholarships for people in low G lower GDP countries. So if, if you find that the pricing of our course is prohibitive, but you're interested, just send me an email. We do have a scholarship application that you can fill out to get a discount or even get a free access to our courses. Sure, sure. Amazing. I'll put, put the link in the chat as well. Uh, just taking another question from the audience. Uh, uh, if there are uh, different PMs taking care of different funnels, say onboarding PM, uh, core PM, and the payment gateway PM, how does the uh, team work together, come together, uh, and solve a continuous discovery? In this case? Yeah, this is a great question. So in order for the product trio model to work, so I'll start with within the team, and then I'll talk about cross teams. So in order for the product trio to work, it's really hard for three people to stay aligned on their thinking, right? And so a lot of the methods you're going to read about in the book or that we talked about are visual methods. They're ways that you can visually externalize your thinking. So we talked about opportunity solution trees. We talked about story mapping. In the book, I also get into experience mapping. It's really important that if we want to work together and coordinate our work with others, that we, we, sub, we visualize, visually externalize our thinking because it helps us stay aligned. So if you're doing that work to stay aligned as a trio, and now you need to coordinate your work with other product teams, you can use the same artifacts to coordinate your work. So you can think about how does my experience map connect with your experience map so we can make sure we're designing a coherent experience. We can look at how do the opportunities on my tree overlap with the opportunities on your tree, and if we're working on similar opportunities, how do we make sure that our solutions connect and are coherent? Um, story mapping can help with that. Does my story map lead into your story map? So a big key to coordinating work, not just across individuals in a team, but also across teams, is to use those visual artifacts to make sure everybody's thinking about things the same way. I have a, a slightly Sorry. similar question just as a follow-up to the previous one. Uh, for bigger teams, this might be a challenge, but... Uh, would you recommend having like a common repository of uh, user research studies where every, every team can tap into? Or do you think having it separately for every team works well? Yeah, so I do think each team needs to be to their own, it needs to do their own interviews. Because again, we're trying to close that gap of the curse of knowledge where you think about the product one way and your customer thinks about it another way. So I think it's really important that every team have firsthand exposure to the customer. Um, one of the tools that I offer in the book is called an interview snapshot. It's just a one-page template that helps you quickly summarize what you're learning from each interview. I do think teams should share snapshots across teams just so that everybody is benefiting from all of the interviews that are happening in the organization and everybody can reference each other's research really quickly. And what's nice about that one-page snapshot is that it's um, nobody's going to watch everybody else's interviews. People don't have time for that, right? And we often share our notes, but it's hard to understand somebody else's notes. So it's just a really easy way to synthesize an interview so you can share it broadly across the organization. Awesome, awesome. And I'll uh, pick one, one more question one more from the... Question I see. Sorry. About just... Am I stuck? Or... No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, sorry. I, I just saw another interesting question uh, in the Q&A tab, which kind of relates to this. Uh, since we have covered a lot of B2C and even Netflix was a B2C example, how would continuous discovery differ or what are some separate uh, points which are which stand, which hold true for B2B, but not B2C? So how would a PM for B2B go about continuous discovery? Yeah, so the method is really similar. There's a couple key differences. So with B2B, you're going to have a more complex user ecosystem, right? You have end users and buyers. Sometimes in B2B, you have multiple types of end users and maybe even multiple people in the buying decision. So if that's the case, you need to make sure that you're interviewing the right people. So if you're working on the part of the product that the end user engages with, then you need to be interviewing end users. If you're working on the part of the product that influences the buying decision, you need to be interviewing buyers. And oftentimes we need to be interviewing both to understand both sides of that equation. So you might have a little bit more complexity on your, in the opportunity space because you're representing needs 
of multiple roles or multiple types of people. We talked a little bit about how your recruiting strategies might change, right? So you can recruit end users within the product. Buyers, you're going to have to use your customer facing teams. Um, assumption testing. If you're assumption testing with buyers, it's a little bit harder. You can't use unmoderated testing tools because your buyers probably aren't using those tools. Um, so you'll have to think about what's the right way to reach them and how do you reach them in mass. Um, but I will say I've worked with plenty of B2B teams. They're using the exact same methods. Oftentimes the recruiting strategies are a little bit different. For end users of B2B products, the recruiting strategies are really similar to B2C. But for buyers in particular, it can be a little bit more complex. And that's where you really want to leverage your customer facing teams. And you can even run assumption tests with your customer facing teams. So for example, we talked through this example where you're launching a one question survey in the product. You could actually have your customer facing teams ask customers that one question survey question. You can have your customer facing teams show a customer a mock-up and collect feedback. Right, so you can use the exact same methods. It's just how you deliver them might change based on your context. Got it, got it. Uh, another interesting question that I see is on the importance of uh, continuous discovery. Is uh, what are your tips on persuading founders or heads of product about the importance of discovery? Uh, where we see in many startups organization a lot of bias towards building fast and. That's when the product team is uh, drives towards you know building faster but with lesser validation. So how do you go about persuading people to make them understand the importance of discovery habits? Yeah, you need to make the pain of building the wrong thing palpable, right? So in startups early on, we think that if we just build something really fast, we'll figure it out. But what ends up happening, startups are cash strapped, right? We have a very limited time before we run out of cash. And so it's actually really important we build the right thing as quickly as possible. And so if you find that you're working at a startup that's turning into this feature factory, just trying to produce as much as you can, what I would do is I would get really clear if for every release, go through this exercise where you say, what do we think the impact of this release is going to be? Write it down. Make sure you can measure it. So instrument your product so that you are actually measuring it and then revisit it in your retrospectives and evaluate how did you do. The more that you can expose that what you're building is not hitting the mark, the more likely you're going to make the case for better discovery. Awesome. We have another question, which is super interesting. How does continuous discovery differ for pre-product market fit and post that? Because pre-product market fit, you might want to know a little more about, you might want to go deeper into how the user thinks about something. How does it differ? Pre PM, PMF and post PMF? You know, it's really the same because the key to both, whether it's discovering a new product or evolving an existing product, is getting a really rich understanding of the opportunity space. So, with the new product, um, especially if it's like a really innovative product and you don't have direct competitors, what you're trying to, you're uncovering unmet needs, pain points, and desires where there aren't existing solutions. And so that's a really ripe opportunity space, but it's still, you're doing the work to uncover the opportunity space. With a more mature product, the opportunity space is, you still have to uncover it. The key difference is there might be existing solutions that address some of the opportunities. So when you're evaluating the opportunity space, you might be choosing opportunities based on how satisfied people are with existing solutions. So you might see a little bit of a difference in terms of how you assess and prioritize the opportunity space, but the methods are still the same. The key to both brand new products and successfully evolving um, existing products is having a deep understanding of the opportunity space and where you can create customer value. Got it. Uh, another question is uh, on how do you accommodate unknown unknowns while sh story mapping the idea? So as you story map, you will have to make decisions that you don't necessarily feel comfortable with. So if I go back, let me find my slides here. If I go back to the story map, so as I was story mapping this idea, I made a decision, right, which was when people are selecting a local channel, they're browsing channels and not shows on that channel, right? I could have made this interface where 
you open your streaming service and you see all the content from that channel, just like it was a movie or a TV show, right? I had to make a decision. You might feel uncomfortable at the time that you're story mapping and making that decision. You want data on it. You want customer feedback on it. In order for us to see our assumptions, we have to make decisions. So when you're story mapping, I want you to think about it as your crummy first draft. You're not going to feel prepared to make the decisions that you're making, but it's okay. You're making decisions so that you can surface assumptions so that you can test them. And if it turns out those were the wrong decisions, you're going to evolve the idea. So when you're first story mapping, the criteria I want you to use is I want you to generate the simplest solution that has the ability to address the outcome. And there will be a lot of unknowns, but as soon as you start assumption testing, you'll, you're gonna start putting some data behind that and your idea will involve, evolve. In fact, we have this belief that like a good idea is just born, but that's not true. Good ideas start as mediocre ideas and they take a lot of work to evolve them into good ideas. And assumption testing is actually giving you the data you need to evolve a mediocre idea into a good idea. So what I would recommend is when you're story mapping, do the best you can and know that you will continue to evolve the idea as you test your assumptions. Awesome. We are almost at time, We, uh, but we usually do a small rapid fire round where we ask some okay. quick questions and you can give us quick answers so we can wrap it up uh, in a good way. Uh, the first question is what are three good books which uh, aspiring PMs or early stage PMs can uh, read to get better at user research or product management in general. Of course, we recommend continuous discovery habits to everyone and we'll put the link in the chat, but what are some good books that have helped you and probably can help others as well? Yeah, so I did design dis continuous discovery habits to be a hands-on guide, so definitely pick that up. Um, inspired by Marty Kagan is obviously a classic in the industry for a very good reason. He introduces some really key concepts that are that will help you just wrap your head around what do we mean by discovery. There's a book called Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. It's a very good summary of what we know about decision-making research. Discovery is all about making good decisions about what to build. It's very accessible. It's very engaging. It will really help you get up to speed on how to improve your decision-making. Um, and then a third one I would say would be if you're at an early stage startup or if you're working on brand new products, Business Model Generation by Alex Osterwalder is a great way to think of the business model side. Um, and for more mature companies, um, actually, I would still say Business Model Generation because it's still really helpful for product people to have that background. Awesome. Thanks for that. We'll put the link to Continuous Discovery Habits and uh, all the other books that Teresa mentioned. And we also had Marty with us uh, last year. We hosted him and it was an amazing session as well. Uh, moving to our next question, who are three folks you would like to give a shout out to? Since a lot of people are watching, is there anyone specific you'd want to give a shout out to? Maybe people who have helped in your career or someone who, who you have enjoyed working with, who could be three interesting people that folks here could go and check out their maybe social handles or get to know more about them. Yeah, so I think we're living in a time period where there's a lot of great product thought leaders creating amazing content. So there's a few people that I'll recommend you check out if you're not already familiar with their work. The first is Melissa Perry. So she wrote Escaping the Build, Build Trap. Her content is phenomenal. She has great product courses. Um, the second is Hope Gurion. She's actually my partner. Um, she actually has a fantastic podcast where she interviews leaders about big product, to um, big product to uh, topics. Um, she does amazing work in this space. Um, and then the third, I will say, um, Christina Wootke. So she wrote Radical Focus. She wrote um, a, a team that manages itself. Really phenomenal content and is really um, creating content that embodies a true agile continuous mindset that's hard to come by. Awesome. All of them amazing folks. Do, do check them out and they have great content to share as well. So I hope everyone learns from them. Uh, last question from RN. What is one advice you'd like to give to your 20 year old self? What is, what is, it could be uh, something about life in general or, or about product management or about career and anything that you'd like to say to your 20 year old self. Yeah, so when I was a 20 year old, I was working, actually, no, I was still in college, huh? 
What would I say to my 20 year old self? Um, I don't know. That's a hard maybe question. 20, maybe 25 uh, year old when you, when you would, started your career. If I would say at the beginning of my career, what I was going to say was um, I worked as a designer in the 90s when there was not a lot of people doing design work yet. I always had to take software engineering jobs to be able to do design work or I was a designer and a product manager in order to be able to do design work. So I would say it gets better. Design becomes a really important role that is acknowledged, um, which would be awesome to know back then. Amazing, amazing. Thanks a lot, Teresa, for the great session and equally good answers in the Q&A tab. Uh, I hope everyone took back a lot of good points that they'll implement and become better in their product careers. Uh, a lot of users uh, sent in their questions, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, Teresa, what would be the best way for anyone to reach out to you? Is it via Twitter or LinkedIn? Or where are you most active? And yeah, so definitely check out um, producttalk.org. We actually have a awesome. membership community that if you yeah. want to um, connect with other like-minded people trying to put the book into practice, that's an awesome option. I am on Twitter at ttaurus, and I am on LinkedIn. I will share that I get my LinkedIn inbox is bombarded, so I'm not huh. always great at responding to LinkedIn messages. Um, but pro but either uh, through our membership community or through uh, Twitter are probably the best places. Awesome. So do tag uh, Teresa and tag us at the right product folks so that we could take in your questions. And if you have anything additional to say to Teresa, do drop in your feedback there. With that, uh, we are closing the session for tonight. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this session, do give us a shout out. Do let Teresa know how much you love this session. And if you have any feedback for us to improve these sessions, just reach out to us, DM us, or, or share your feedback with us. And we'll make sure to keep improving this. We have a couple of other events planned as well throughout this month. So make sure to check out our website, theproductfolks.com. I will be putting the link in the chat. And uh, awesome. See you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for the bye great bye. questions. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for joining.